conservative media done you right. You're listening to ISHR and welcome to freedom fest 2016 live from planet hollywood las vegas nevada i'm sackhead clint to my right is sackhead sean again Ooh. not that anybody can see yeah, you keep throwing that out there like anyone's gonna even care on left right but that's okay keep going it's freedom fest sean they care if you're left or right <laughs> oh what you are good point we are sitting here today as part of the SHR Media Network uh, with Mr. Paul Dykowitz. Uh, we had an opportunity to speak last year, and a uh, phenomenal author. He's the author of Holy Smokes, Golden Guidance from Notre Dame's Championship Chaplain, uh, with a foreword uh, by Lou Holtz. Welcome back, sir. A pleasure to be here. How have you been? I've been doing great. Uh, we've, we've had a good year uh, with, the book, with the book, and we've got uh, a number of articles that I've been able to do about faith-based leadership. That's been uh, very powerfully uh, shown by a number of people, from Nick Saban at the University of Alabama uh, to John Harbaugh with the uh, Baltimore Ravens uh, to a host of others. And you also had a demonstration of it with the Villanova basketball program, showing the unselfishness uh, that that team exhibited the whole year uh, by having their star player give up the ball at the very end of the game to an open teammate to hit the game-winning shot. No matter who hit that shot, they became national champions. Absolutely. So they fulfilled their goal nonetheless as a team. Absolutely, as a team instead of individuals. Which, which is, is a big deal, and it's something that's definitely lost in this country, I think. Today, absolutely. Now, you were talking uh, off record with us. We've had an opportunity to speak, and you were talking specifically about Harbaugh uh, and the Baltimore Ravens and some of the things that that team um, really has, has endured. And uh, would you mind sharing that with our listeners? I, I think it's just really been behind the, uh, behind the uh, headlines for the most part, except he did send out an open letter to his team when they had a heartbreaking situation occur. One of the promising players, 23-year-old Trey Walker, a defensive back, was back home in Miami after his rookie season trying to enjoy himself and took out a dirt bike and unfortunately was involved in a tragic accident in which he went uh, head, head on into an SUV. And it, 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 he had a catastrophic head injury, even though he was one of the strongest and uh, healthiest young men you'd probably meet outside of this accident, uh, it, the next day it claimed his life. And uh, John Harbaugh found out about it and uh, had a sleepless night and, and, and just had a heartfelt letter that he wrote to his team the next morning after tossing and turning and talked about wanting to give them all fatherly advice. And it was faith-based. And it's from the heart. And so he was not shy at all about sharing his values, his leadership, and just wanting them to use good judgment, you know, keep in mind the people who depend on them, uh, make sure that they don't take unnecessary risks, model themselves after people who they want to follow. Mm -hmm. So you emulate and have great role models, and then try to do the right things. Uh, And then you also want to eat the right foods, live the right way, and it was just great advice for any person, but especially young people. Uh, and I think he was probably thinking, what, I, what would I tell Trey Walker if I could talk to him before the accident occurred and give him great fatherly advice? And one drawback that the NFL has, and it's something that you might want to uh, keep in mind if you're a fan and you just wonder how some of these players get, get mixed up in things in the off season. Well, the teams don't have much contact with players in the off season. Uh, there are certain rules about what contact players can have. There's some even you know dr- drills that are voluntary workouts uh, in in the uh, preseason in, in the off season, and so the teams don't have as much contact as they probably would like, you know, because of the way the rules were set up and they've got a labor contract. But it was just a very powerful letter that I think would benefit any young person. And the other thing that that John Harbaugh did that really stood out last season is they had a number of injuries to key players. Their starting quarterback uh, Joe Flacco went down for the season. Uh, their best receiver went down for the season, Steve Smith. Um, their great pass rushing defensive end, Terrell Suggs, was injured for the whole season early on. And they kept happy to one player after the next. They were bringing people from the practice squad onto the main main stage to play on the team. They were bringing people from off the streets who had been cut by other teams to fill a roster spot. And they were just doing the best they could, coaching up whoever they were bringing out the next week to fill an open position because a starter got hurt. 
and they were losing close games instead of winning close games, what they typically had did, did in past years. So instead of finishing in the playoffs, they finished out of the playoffs. But he still kept the team focused and would mention in, in faith-based ways, quoting scripture, quoting things he read in the Bible that morning or learned from the Bible study that were fresh in his mind, that were in his heart, to try to keep his team fired up about doing their best, realizing that every day was a chance to serve the Lord in some form or fashion and give it your absolute best and, you know, serve your team. You're playing for your community. You're playing for your city. Uh, you're playing for each other. And, and you know, getting them fired up to give their best. And even though they only won five games out of fifth, out of 16 last year, they still beat their arch rival Pittsburgh Steelers twice in two games. So uh, it just shows when you get fired up and you give it your best, you can sometimes still do some things that are pretty amazing, even if you're undermanned. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting to hear uh, a, a professional coach doing that for their team. I mean, you, you look at some coaches that are up-and-coming coaches, the high school level, um, and, and even some of the junior high level, and there's stories all the time about how um, these coaches try and instill faith. I mean, not it's not like they're saying you have to practice this particular religion, but where they're having some form of faith-based meeting or prayer before the game or something, which really, I believe, is a positive influence in, in anybody's life, but particularly in young men, um, and, and they just they get sued, they get, they get slammed, they get fired, and so to have a professional coach uh, really kind of engage in that um, is, is refreshing. Do you know, did he get any pushback from that at all from the community or from the Players Association or anything like that? Actually, it was interesting. I, I talked to Notre, uh, to uh, Baltimore, Ra- the Baltimore Ravens non-denominational team chaplain yeah. paid by the team to be there when anybody needs him. He's near the weight room. And he said he would look and see how the players reacted. And he said they really seemed to, to uh, take it to heart because the coach was speaking from the heart. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about things that touched him, things that were motivating him. And he, he was able to get the attention of his team, never lost the attention of his team. Their energy didn't wane. Their determination to give it their best each each Sunday didn't wane, even though they were out without their team leader, the quarterback, even though their best defensive lineman was, was gone. And the, the list goes on about all the injuries. The other thing that really stood out to me is his brother Jim Harbaugh, the football coach at Michigan, did uh, an event at uh, uh, Paramus Catholic High School in which they just basically were trying to coach up high school students, not necessarily top recruits. Many of them, most of them probably will never get to the NFL, let alone to a college field. But they were giving them some great advice. So John Harbaugh was allowed by his brother Jim to speak to the team. And he basically said, uh, or to speak to all the players who had gathered, he said, who read the Bible this morning? He raised his hand, and he was sharing a Bible story. And he, he saw a few hands pop up. It was on video, and I, I noticed it. He said, that's not that many. So I want to see more than more in the next the next time. But he, then he shared a story that he read it from the Bible uh, about uh, a, a, a person in the Bible who had basically slayed a lion and and went into the lion's uh, you know a hole and and basically was able to do something pretty special. And he said, if your goals aren't high enough and people aren't making fun of you, m- make them higher. And he said, you need to figure out what the lion is in your life so that you can pursue that. And you can pursue, you can go after the lion, and maybe you can slay the lion or achieve your goal. And so that was a great way to, you know, teach people about motivating themselves, especially at that high school age, get them fired up about starting each day, not not being deterred in case people made fun of them, question whether their goals were something that could be achievable, and thought, dream big, go for it, give it your best. And, and, and that was really powerful, too. So, again, that's another instance where he's just being himself. And instead of being one of these politically correct people thinking, I don't know if I should impose my faith on anybody else right. or let them know I have certain beliefs that drive me every day mm-hmm. and get me fired up to do the best I can every day, he shared that with others. And then it's up to them to decide if that's something that they want to adopt or whether they don't. But it seemed like there was attentiveness of every one of those kids hearing this former Super Bowl winning coach talk, and he just so happened to also be a very faithful person. You know, Paul, one of the things I admire about you is every time we talk, you're passionate about the topic. And, and that's, that is very refreshing to see. I mean, we interview um, a ton of people, and we interview a lot of people, and some of them, you know, everybody's kind of excited about what they do, um, but there's a difference between being excited about what you do and being passionate, passionate. about what you very do. Very big difference. Um, very and big. So, so thank you for your passion because that's, that's contagious, and I'm sure that comes through to our listeners also. So what motivated you, and I'm guessing some of it was this, this passion that you have on the topic, to write your book? That's a great question. And, and one thing that stuck out to me as I was pursuing uh, a book project, I had in vision doing a book 
I really wanted to make a difference in, in people's lives. I wanted a book that would be transformational. Mm -hmm. And I wanted a book that could become people's favorite books. They were one among people's favorite books. And one thing that stood out about Father James really, who I featured in my book with his life and guidance, is that no matter who I seem to talk to, he made a dramatic difference in the lives of the people who we influenced. From coaches like Lou Holtz, who did the forward for the book, which is the, it's a powerful forward that would just blow you away about how he didn't think his team necessarily would have won the national title the year they did without Father Reilly's role. And if you hear about the, the key role he had behind the scenes, certain things he said at critical games, you'll understand why. And I'll share one story with you that dramatizes it. They had to beat the University of Miami Hurricanes, coached by Jimmy Johnson, that had an incredible reign of success in college football, year after year winning national titles. But to go through uh, Miami was the path to the national championship for Notre Dame. Well, no, Miami came to Notre Dame one Saturday in the fall. And they basically were doing their exercises, and it was a pregame uh, situation. It was tense. It was known as the Catholics versus convicts game <laughs> in the media. <laughs> and the irony there is I'd actually interviewed the Miami coach years later who said, you know, I was Catholic. I was the coach in Miami. I thought it was hysterical that the media turned it into the Catholics versus convicts. But the reality was Miami was noted for, uh, you know, behavior that led to the taunting rule yeah, in right. college football. Because they would taunt. They would t beat teams decisively, and instead of beating them with a sense of class and decorum, they would, you know, taunt, and they would, you know, make fun of the other team. And so in this particular instance, they had the same attitude. They're going to take it to Notre Dame, and they're in Notre Dame Stadium, but they're not going to show respect. So they went through a practice line and kind of disrupted Notre Dame's pregame preparation, and that led to some words back and forth, and that led to a physical altercation. Uh, and then, you know, some punches were thrown, and some people got bloody. Wow. And so we did, that's how it started. So both teams went to the respective locker rooms before the game, and with great attention, Notre Dame's players were waiting to, see, to hear what Father really would say about this. And so it was almost like what would be God's representative's opinion about what happened. And I'll share a story that I put in the book. And he said, gentlemen, I can't believe the way that they behave. He said, I want you to, he said, they deserve to be put in their place. I want you to go out there and start this game. Notre Dame sacked Miami's quarterback seven times. The game went down to the last play. And Notre Dame won by a point when Miami's two-point conversion, with the pass going to former, to future Hall of Fame receiver Michael Irvin, was wow. was stopped. Wow! Wow! And uh, Notre Dame won that game by a point. Ended up winning all the rest of their games and taking the national title that season. Amazing! And it was it was just a, a couple years ago, two or three years before, where Notre Dame got bl absolutely blown out by Miami. And it was quite a transformation with Lou Holtz taking over the head coaching job at Notre Dame, turning the team around, turning attitudes around. And Father really was a key part of that inspiration. And that was really the reason, because there's story after story about that, all behind the scenes you never would have heard about. But by talking to Joe Montana and Joe Theismann and Rocket Ishmael, um, Reggie Brooks, it all became clear. And I'll share a story. Reggie Brooks later converted to Catholicism. He works at Notre Dame, but you might remember him as a you know perennial All-American running back. He went to the Washington Redskins when mm -hmm. he was a healthy yep. rookie, ran for over a thousand yards his first season, yep. and and was just a, an amazing uh, you know player. Once scored a touchdown when he was unconscious. Uh, and, and the story there is where he was hit by a Michigan uh, linebacker before he crossed the goal line on a goal line plunge, and he held on to the ball even though. He he was sort of knocked unconscious. He crossed the goal line with the ball before he fumbled it. They went to the replay. They looked at it. They ruled that he had crossed the ball with, wow. the, ball, with wow. the goal line with the ball still in his possession. So that's the story about Reggie Brooks scoring when he was unconscious. However, there was one situation after the next that Father really noticed Reggie Brooks would get very nervous before football games. You'd think he's been in all kinds of high school games. He's been in Notre Dame games before on the big stage. Yeah. He would get so nervous. So Father really realized that he'd been a former salesman before he became a priest. So he knew how to talk persuasively, but also how to listen and read people. So he realized Reggie needed to be loosened up a little bit before the games. And Father really had a great sense of humor. In fact, one chapter on its own is just about sharing a sense of humor. And so Reggie said Father really would always find a way to make him laugh. He'd come over, talk to him in some, some form or fashion. No matter what, would, what it would be, he would find a way to make him laugh, make him relax, and Reggie could go out and play a great game. The other thing that Reggie used to say before he became Catholic, when he was still uh, just a student in Notre Dame, he said Father really always found a way to tie the game into the Mass. 
the homily would somehow always connect the readings <laughs> to the game and getting, you know, doing your best for the Lord. And he said there were some times where there would be a reading and he said, no way he's going to do it this Saturday. This is going to stump him. Not even the great Father Jane really, the legendary Notre Dame chaplain, is going to be able to tie these readings into the game. And he said he always found a way to do it and it just blew him away time and time again. So those stories just kept getting shared by these prominent athletes and coaches who didn't have to give me the time of day. Rocket Ishmael gave me more than an hour of his time. Wow. Reggie Brooks, you know, very generous with his time, too, probably almost as much. You know, people like Joe Montana, Joe Theismann, Red, you know, you, the list goes on. Eric Parsegian, you know, Digger Phelps, Dick Vitale. You talk about Father really? Oh, absolutely. I've got more stories to share with you. <laughs> and so what I did is I actually took another full year to reorganize everything into individual chapters to guide you properly. And wow. Father really was kind of a very humble person. And he might not have liked the biography about himself. And I kept thinking about that. I was trying to, or, tried to organize it. However, he would love a book that helped people because that's so much of a part of what he did. Right. Including in the movie Rudy where he appeared as the uh, priest in the locker room before Rudy played his only game. And he was also part of the composite character Father uh, Kavanaugh in that movie. Yep. And every time Rudy needed him, Father Kavanaugh was there day or night. And so Father really, really liked to help people and use some of his uh, experiences with, with them. The other thing that stood out about Father really that, Clint, that I think is very important to keep in mind is that he had a hard life. His father died when he was an Notre Dame freshman. Wow. wow. Suddenly of a heart attack. So if you can imagine you're a freshman at Notre Dame trying to make all these adjustments, trying wow. to deal with the academic pressures, and, you know, just, you know, have, have a transition, you know, from being uh, at home to being at school, and then to get the, the word that your father just died. And suddenly he's the, he's the man of the house. He's the oldest son. And he's got to go back home. He had to leave his school and, uh, and finish his degree in Pittsburgh. He didn't have wow. the money to finish the degree. And you know, and then he became a champion fundraiser when he got to Notre Dame as a priest. Later, later on, he was also a former business person, was successful in helping to raise a scholarship fund at the Monogram Club, turned it into the the largest uh, scholarship fund of any Letterman's Club in the country from any university, uh, largely through his efforts. So, for a priest to be somebody who could have business acumen. Yeah, and, and it's a big invest, deal. invest wisely, and there are probably there are many students out there now who have Notre Dame degrees who otherwise wouldn't have been able to afford to go there or continue their degrees. One but, of the one of the most powerful stories I'll share involves a dentist who was not a star player; he was a walk-on, and he uh, and he got a, a spot on the baseball team. He didn't play much. And his senior year, he decided not to play to focus on his grades to get into dental school. Well, his daughter ultimately got to Notre Dame. And when he was a freshman, he was not going to be able to continue on. He was going to transfer to the University of Minnesota due to a lack of funds. Father really caught wind of it, heard about it, called him up and said, is there any other reason other than finances you're not coming back in the fall? He said, no, that's it. I loved it. He said, well, you come on back. You get your stuff. You bring it over here. I'll go talk to the talk to the scholarship folks. We'll, 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 get, we'll get this wow. worked out. That's he, amazing. He got him more scholarship money, and then he also had to call in a favor to a friend who said, if you ever have anybody you really feel special about who needs some financial help, you call me and I'll do it. He said, wow. I've got somebody just like that right now. Wow. And that student, even though he had a lot of dirty jobs, he did enough he could during the, during the, uh, the non-school year to raise money, but he ultimately got a Notre Dame degree, and not only did he become a successful cosmetic dentist, helping people with restoration if they had an accident, you know, making sure they had nice smiles afterward, his daughter was able to get a Notre Dame degree, and that's just an amazing tribute to him. Wow. Right, so that's two degrees all, all, all because of the good father. Just the tip uh, of the iceberg. Going, uh, going the extra mile, too. And like you said, he, he was obviously multifaceted. Uh, and his knowledge well beyond just the Bible and, and being a priest. And a and great conservative priest, you know, really traditional, uh, you know, in no cafeteria Catholic <laughs> issues with Father Real. He, <laughs> right. he is the real deal, very devout and very focused on it and willing to help people of any faith. His prayer list was, was really long. People of any faith, if you had a need, you'd go to him, you'd offer a prayer. He's happy to pray for anybody, special intentions. If somebody had a need, no matter what their background or anything else, he was happy to step in and do it. And I'll give you one story about a paralyzed high school football player. He heard about this young man, and somebody said, if you could give him a call, we think it would help lift his spirits. He's very uh, depressed about you know, having his life change so dramatically to become somebody who's paralyzed, who is a great athlete and was going to be a Division One scholarship candidate. So Father really found out about it, called him up. They spoke for a good hour. It wasn't just a quick phone call. And then a year later, the same person who made that request saw Father Reilly, and Father Reilly said, how is this person doing? 
and he had to think for a second and then realized it was the young man wow. he'd asked to have prayers for. And he said, oh, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it until you mentioned me. He said, I pray for him every day. Wow. 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 That's what a special individual. Um, so you also mentioned you had some articles that you've published, also one published today? Yes, in fact, uh, this is tied directly to Freedom Fest. You might have been aware yesterday, uh, had some great presentations, and one of the featured one was the Bull, Bulls versus Bears. It was an investment panel in which uh, they were asking different, well, uh, well, uh, uh, well qualified and also successful investment advisors what they would recommend. So they had the Bears being Peter Schiff and Burt Doman, and the the Bulls being Keith Fitzgerald and Alex Green, and they went back and forth about what you should be investing in. So the, the, the basic focus was, yes, there are risks to, to the market, uh, not only domestically because of the, the Obamacare costs and because of the uh, unfunded pension plans and because of the high U.S. debt, and also in Europe because of the, the uh, Brexit, which is the exit of mm-hmm. the United Kingdom from the European Union. And uh, you got terrorism. It's still, unfortunately, uh, terrible uh, it was, uh, the act of terrorism in, in Nice, France. Yep. On Bastille Day, all of all things, which is the equivalent of our Independence Day in yep. America. Uh, and so th- these things can affect the markets, especially for short periods. But the key was gold looks like a good investment right now. So I emphasize that. And there's particular funds that were uh, worth uh, noting. GDX is the ticker of one fund, which is a gold mining uh, fund. Mm-hmm. Also, if you're wanting to take a little bit more of an aggressive position, more speculative position, you can go to GDX, uh, uh, GDXJ, which is the uh, junior gold mining stocks. So those are typically the smaller ones, but small cap stocks typically rise more and they fall more. Right. So if it looks like it's a, an ascending gold market, that might be the time to take that extra risk and go into the junior gold fund. Uh, so those are two options. And then Keith Fitzgerald, like uh, American Water Works, which is a company he thinks has a really good future because the need for water is just going to increase with our population. Yes, it Worries will. about drought and those kinds of issues popping up in certain places like right. California and other uh, you know parched areas of the country. So those were some good investment opportunities. And then uh, Alex Green actually said, you know, what's been really hurting in recent years has been emerging markets. And he said, those folks in the emerging markets want the same kind of uh, opportunities that we have here for the goods that we use and the kind of quality of life that we have. So he said, over time, if you look at what's undervalued, it comes back into vogue. So he said, if you're looking to get a contrarian play right now, an emerging markets fund is a good one. And the one he specifically cited was EEM. That's the ticker for that emerging markets fund. So good investment ideas besides good, uh, just good, good feedback about living better. And where can we find your article for that? That uh, a couple places. One, Eagle Daily Investor. Mm-hmm. Uh, it will be posted there. It, it's actually also on humanevents.com. And uh, over the weekend, it will be posted on townhall.com. Outstanding. So three places right there. And then you can always go to my website for my book. It's holysmokesbook.com. The columns uh, and my articles are all funneled through there. So if you look at my latest uh, writings, you can find that on my book's website as well. Do you have any book projects in the works? I do. I've got a project uh, I'm working on with the most miraculous or inspirational stories of various clergymen. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's another one that I'm um, interested in doing. Um, There's uh, an instance about divine mercy in practicality. There was a young man who was killed in a car crash, 17-year-old hockey star. Uh, the driver was a graduate student who otherwise might have had to leave graduate school because they were at the Uniformed Services University and they were part of the military. So instead of having the most draconian penalty applied to this driver, uh, the parents asked the local prosecutor not to have manslaughter charges brought wow. because that would have forced the person out of the military, whether the charges would have been proven uh, beyond a reasonable doubt or not. Right. And so they had to reach out, write a letter, intervene, went and, and contacted the person who was the driver, uh, let them know they were praying for them. They wanted to wow. make sure that they were going to be okay. And with that sense of forgiveness, that person has had an amazing ability to come back from knowing that she was responsible for killing a young man and, and looks like she's going to graduate. Uh, wow. I talked to her about a month ago, graduate. And so these parents and the, the young man who was killed were uh, proponents of divine mercy. And so what happened is it really took it from an, an abstract concept 
into a practical situation, and it's led to tremendous healing both for the family that suffered the loss as well as for this young lady who now can do good things as a clinical psychologist wow. once she finishes her, her graduate school training, and she's working on finishing a Ph.D. studies. Do you have a name for the book yet or for your project? No, I don't. And then there's also another one I'm, I'm looking to do on dividends, uh, income investing. Okay. There are a lot, especially with people right now getting a pittance for their you know, bank account savings. Right. Uh, there are a lot of investments you can use to get some income that's not very high risk. And so I think that'll be a benefit. The question of how many hours in the day I have to work on all these projects. I was just well, going to ask you, my, my next question is, do you ever stop? You know, I, I realize I've got a limited number of years on uh, on this earth, and I try to have some fun and do things I like recreationally. Right. You know, and, and but I also realize that I've got some time outside of work, and I, I try to maximize it. And uh, you know, these these transformational books, I think, are something very special. And I'm just hoping to do one after the next and be productive. And and one of my mentors is Dr. Mark Skousen, who runs Fiend Fest, and he's done over 30 books. So I look at what he's accomplished. Yeah. Turn it out about a book a year, and I said, well. If, if Mark can do that, I can do that. <laughs> and, you know, I'll tell you what, if you want a really motivational book, you can write it on the sackheads and about how two knuckleheads transformed internet radio. I'm just throwing it out there. That could be another book down the road. Just keep up the good work you guys are doing. Thank Paul, you Paul, so it has much, been a Paul. pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure, as always. Thank you. It's an honor. Sean, live from the Freedom Fest floor, uh, 2016. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. More to come. Great. Oh, yeah. Listening to the SHR Media Network.